Good afternoon and welcome to the De Morgan Foundation's lunchtime lecture series for the 10th of February 2023 or whenever you're watching us if you're watching the recording on YouTube. It's my pleasure today to welcome Dr Alice Eden to give us a talk on the Victorian visionaries, um, so dreams and stories, modern pre-Raphaelite visionaries. Alice Eden is a historian of art and culture, writer and research curator. She is co-curator of Dreams and Stories, Modern Pre-Raphaelite Vis Visionaries, an exhibition of forgotten and late pre-Raphaelite artists and British symbolists working between 1880 and 1930, which is currently on at the Watts Gallery and is for another week if you're watching live. So do get down to see it. The exhibition was previously at Levington Spa Art Gallery um, and Alice edited an academic publication for the exhibition with essays and completed comprehensive catalogue entries. Alice is currently working on a publication with Routledge on spirituality, feminism, pre-Raphaelitism in modern British art and culture, which is forthcoming in 2023 and one that I certainly can't wait to read and have a look at. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alice. I'm going to hand over to you. Um, oh. Whilst Alice is speaking, I will turn my video off so I'm not distracting. And Alice is also going to turn hers off to help with the bandwidth today. Thanks, Alice. Over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks so very much and for that lovely introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to turn my video off and just get straight on with it because there's some lovely artworks I'm going to start talking about. <clears throat> so today I'm introducing um, this exhibition, Dreams and Stories, that's on at the Watts Gallery. And um, I will probably have a varied uh, level of information and backgrounds ourselves about what the, who the Pre-Raphaelites were and the nature of this exhibition. And you may already have been to it, but um, I think that's fine. We're going to re-engage and I, I personally find something new every time I'm looking at these pictures. It's such an exciting uh, show, such a range of contrasting uh, types of imagery. And throughout, there was always, in the curating of this, there was always a tension between um, the idea of um, pre-Raphaelite revival and looking back and engaging with the ever-changing present day in this period of modernity. I mean, at the exact moment we're looking, sort of the period 1880 to 1920, 1930, we have lots of really um, tangible change happening around the artists. We have the arrival of aeroplanes and motor cars, the first moving pictures and recorded sound, electricity moving into domestic homes, the era of the Titanic. But at the same time, um, there, was, there were great revivals, both of pre-Raphaelite art and older craft methods, and also of spiritual languages. Uh, ancient hermetic languages such as theosophy, Rosicrucianism on the continent as well. And spiritualism, of course, which was uh, very important to Evelyn Pickering de Morgan and her husband. So as we start to look at the pictures, we're going to see um, pictures made in the modern world, yet containing so many haunting echoes of the Victorian age and the sort of... Um, Victorian languages of art, of sentimentality and emotion, of narrative and drama, of prettiness and sweetness, uh, the, the emotional ideals. So um, I included first off, because just to set the context, just an image to contrast, to really show how brave the artists in this exhibition were being at a time where the art world was being sort of thrown apart by these brand new breaks with the past, with rupturing from the past, and how brave it was to actually carry on and to create and display their visions on the walls of the Royal Academy, etc. And, you know, be very proud of continuing. And yet I would say right from the outset, it was never a sense of simply copying the past of just revival in the manner of unthinking copies. There's always a sense of revivalism as a recreation, as a reframing within the modern, as a way of understanding the modern world through rethinking its older visual languages. And these were themes that were very important in the uh, makeup of the show. 
And again, with this show, you feel some sort of uh, of the main uh, themes and, and, and people need to be outlined. So I've included some areas on the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, the PRB, as we've called it, modern Pre-Raphaelites. The artists in the later period of the modern, from around the, turn, the end of the 19th century, and as we moved into the modern century, they were, kept, they were very interested in the art of the PRB, who founded, who were founded in 1848. This was a Victorian art movement. But in their day, they were rebels. They were, it was found, the group was founded by a number of young men, and they wished to rebel against the sort of formality and rules of art teaching at the Royal Academy. They called uh, Joshua Reynolds, the, the uh, the head of the Royal Academy, it's a Sloshua Reynolds. So they're very, they're very rebellious young people. And this came through in their artworks, which it's harder to understand today just how revolutionary they were. Um, going from large history painting, which was sort of uh, subdued brown, darker tones, dark, very dark black, um, these sorts of large vistas to their new versions, their dramatically new versions. And they were inspired by the early Renaissance art, by the primitive or naive Renaissance art of say, Fra Angelico. Um, these are some early examples by Millet and Rossetti. And you can see how they're using sort of iconic early Renaissance forms and using these very vivid uh, primary colors, which were just shocking. I mean, one, uh, author has written that it was like going into the Royal Academy and shining a light in people's eyes. That's how sort of dramatic the change was. And also these, these paintings were critiqued for an incredibly high level of detail. Um, so say you look at this uh, picture by Millet of Christ in the house of his parents on the left, and you have excuse me you have um all these um fragments of wood on the wood chippings on the floor and the detail and it was also a new interpretation of biblical stories where they didn't it wasn't deemed appropriate that christ would be depicted around the the, the wood rubbish like that so um, they were basically trying to break all the rules these are included to show you some of the iconic to remind us really uh, some of the iconic forms and some of the uh, types of style and imagery here will stay in your mind as we look at the other works. They'll, they'll, they're reminiscent. You can see the revivalism because the revivals are never direct. They're never direct copies, but the illusion and the, um, the sanctity, the homage to them is very direct. And particularly to these later Rossetti artworks where the focus is very much on an emotive mood, a uh, suggestibility, and a an introspection and focus. The, the, um, the confidence to do that, to reduce down to an iconic form, that's, that's very important to the later artists as well. And these images of Jane Burden, who was Jane Morris, are some of the most famous in the canon of Western art. And this is Burn Jones, very much associated with the pre raphaelite and we have the elongated figures, the knights, and the, the manner of the composition, this formalized structure, hieratic structures. Again, these are these are forms and echoes we're going to see in the later works. Now, these two are by Rossetti, watercolors, beautiful uh, primary colors, very rich, layered, dense watercolor. And these are included in the exhibition as you go into the upper room. And they're included as an example of original PRB to show how these were sort of interacted with for the later artists to be shown side by side with, with artists working 50 years later. And in these pictures, you've got, as I've mentioned, that focus on the intense iconic type moment reduced down. So the kiss in Roman de la Rose on the left and the formation of the shapes across the figures in the second with the clasped hands in a chain and the cherubs at the back. So you can see these formats that might be appropriate to stained glass, for example, and a heavy use of decorative areas back to back filling the space. Okay, so that's a little bit of intro, the overall where, where we see it, where we get to with the modern period. The modern pre-Raphaelites 
they're an intriguing mix of the two as I've said, so of this sense of the past, this wonder, this sense of not wanting to leave behind the enchantment of the 19th century and the beauty in the sort of modern world that seemed to be crashing in around with its noise and transport and technology and such. This painting, as you go into the uh, exhibition in the small room, the top room, this is from a private collection and uh, we're just so glad to have this painting, The Close of Day by Frederick Cayley Robinson. This picture is an interior, as you can see, uh, a, a form that, we would, that viewers were terribly familiar with within the Victorian art world. Many, many interiors were painted and they were usually narrative in form and they had a range of meanings that would be known, knowable and known and familiar, even comforting, could be a comforting genre. However, in the works of Kayleigh Robinson, he returns to this type of this format over and over and over throughout his career. It was a mode he found very, very apt to exploring the ideas and the sense of the troubled sort of sense of modernity that has he perceived it. And this was informed by his connection with theosophy, which was a movement uh, that permeated culture from the late 19th century. Theosophy means divine wisdom. And uh, the theosophists at that time, they, they grew in number and they, they looked at signs and symbols from ancient times. You know, they tried to draw patterns across in the history of esoteric thought within uh, Britain. They found interrelationships, they searched for eternal truths, they had texts, and they had a number of ideas such as reincarnation. So there's some similarities with today, something like Buddhism. They believed in um, the, the surface and the, the other, other presences beyond. Okay, so the surface is just a sign and there's many, many more things beyond, around, through. Any sense of normal physical understanding of the world was rethought and sort of open up really. So with this it roughly in mind, I'm just gonna look at this painting in a bit more detail. So in this picture, we've got, as I said, we come to look at it and we think, oh, lovely, a pretty pre-Raphaelite type picture. And this was how critics saw it too, a pretty pre-Raphaelite type picture. Lovely uh, young women in a room, something we're very used to, looking reposeful and thoughtful, um, you know, very feminine. We've even got some beautiful feminine colours in that pink, that sumptuous pink there. But also, I mean, this, this dress at the front is a tour de force, isn't it, of, of uh, layers and texture and trans translucency, really, really beautiful. And that reminds me of, say, Tissot and um, even the French modernist, who Kelly Robinson was uh, very clever at combining his knowledge of modern French art from his training at the Academy Julien in the 1890s when he was right at the heart of all the modern movements there and the mod modern art movements there in Paris at that time they actually revered Burne Jones there was a cult of Burne Jones at that time and Rossetti and the pre-Raphaelites were you know um, fashionable so we've got this complex combination of you know looking back to what should be traditional Victorianism when actually the sort of elements they're reviving thinking about are really clever and modern and interesting. So again he's using his mastery of, of paint um, and layering of paint here. I also want to draw attention to the white tablecloth. This is, I just find this absolutely stunning. When you think about, um, I don't know if anyone has seen the Lorenzo and Isabella painting by Millet, so obviously original PRB, it's in the Walker Art Gallery in Liverpool, it's quite large and it's very striking. It has a white tablecloth like this, it's presented the other way actually to the viewer, but, and here you can see in the Cayley Robinson the white on white painting and the, the veneer on that tablecloth, it's creases, the little patterns on it, the play of light, the warmth, everything is just rendered absolutely expertly. But there's a hyper-realism which apes and looks back to Millet, to the early PRB, where they were inspired by the idea of truth to nature. Now this was something that Ruskin, the great art critic who supported the PRB, who was their sort of um, saviour at times, 
um, he encouraged them in this to go to nature and to paint. He literally said paint everything. But I mean, Millet did try and copy that in some. You saw in Ophelia earlier in the Ophelia in the water. Um, where you just find so many elements, flowers, grass, water, painted absolutely tried to truth to life. So he's echoing, he's looking back to Millet, but he's also, Kelly Robinson is also, um, within his time with theosophy, with the symbolist movement in Europe, and with all their thoughts about things and objects, so they had a lot of um, interesting thoughts about the resonance and spiritual interplay of objects. They endowed them with sort of more life and meaning and animation. Um, and theosophists did too, theosophical writings did. So if you look at this painting, say the top right hand corner, you can see a little little tiny dash of light coming through and there is there's a moth actually lit up there and you can see the light just tracing through the green curtain as well and on the back left you can see some vague areas of there's a sash an oversized huge sash to the window which makes you wonder what how big this window is going up and how deep this sort of cavernous uh, room is but what I'm drawing attention to is this vague shadow and lines and strangeness going on there. And then as you pull out to the left, can you see this terribly overly shiny uh, cabinet right on the left, a sliver on the left hand side is a cabinet with drawers. And it's so highly polished that you can see the entire form of the girl, including all the ringlets of her hair, all the patterns of her dress lit up in that cabinet on the left. And all of these areas, and I could name lots more as well as I look at this picture, these areas are playing with surface and the beyond, with the nature and solidity of form, you know, uh, the physicality, the, the material object and the immaterial. Because theosophy felt that the objects you see and feel around you, even yourself, your body, is just a shadow of um, how great and how unknown the universe is. I mean, this is quite an eternal idea that's in lots of, sort of, um, of the more Eastern religions. And therefore, these signs here are pointing to, are evoking the eternal. And uh, another little element, as I say, there's so much detail in this picture, but more elements to support that, those thoughts, those theosophical sense there, include the locked drawers, uh, this one's got a keyhole. In other paintings, he includes a key. Some he doesn't. Some the drawer is open. Another thing is this chair. The back, back right, there's um, a Macintosh style. The chair is in the style of Charles Rennie Macintosh, who he very likely knew when he later worked at the Glasgow School of Art and he taught there. And these chairs themselves, Macintosh was also intrigued by all manner of spiritual thoughts. And his art was very much based around symbols uh which you know we've tried to unpack uh, modern scholarship has tried to unpack but a lot of them do remain closed within rosicrucianism and some of the more cult um like the freemason world the symbols aren't meant to be generally known they're secret in theosophy it's open that's the point everyone can learn the eternal the divine wisdom in any case um so in this picture there's all these elements of something being closed and hidden behind and we can read that through all the objects the height and meaning of the objects we've also got another modern element in freud's interpretation of dreams was recently written around 1899 in fact it coincides side to this painting that the thoughts were already being thoughts of the unconscious and new understandings of dreams and the subconscious were were prevalent in Europe these ideas had been being increasingly thought about um, in the second half of the 19th century and that dreamlike sense um, what Freud called the dream work a, a process of compression and distortion of images of like heightening and presence and the sense of everyday objects becoming like hieroglyphics. Um, that's very evident. You can read this picture again through those thoughts 
And whilst I could stay on this picture, it's just on this picture for so long. If I just skip to this picture, which is another interior by Katie Robinson called The Foundling. Um, this will just, again, look at some of these themes, but another type of manifestation. Now here, um, we've got a, a similar theme. We've got the domestic interior again. I said he returns to this over and over, but we have a different rendition of it. We've got this sickly child to start with, which is slightly provides a sense of foreboding in the viewer initially with the visible injury and with her sort of um, warmed face by the fire with the red and her sort of scent sort of dozing off a little bit. There's a sense of concern there, the languorous arm, etc. Um, the awkwardness of the arm and the body, that recurs as well, the sense of awkwardness. Um, all these themes he uses very carefully and very deliberately, always to create a sense of unease. And in that way, he's very much attuned with what was going on in symbolist Europe and even with the symbolist poets like Paul Verlaine and others who he read um, at that time and, the, and their concern with the uncanny and um, you know spookiness as well and all these elements. So looking again at this picture, there's something a bit disturbing about the approach of the woman who's meant to be the carer for the child, but the way the, the body is presented, the angular shape, the way that her sort of back bends round and is almost disappearing, is becoming vague, the awkwardness of her arm, um, that is akin to some of the more mysterious pictures, say, for example, like Vern Jones, like fairy tale type pictures. And then we look at the creation, the composition of the picture, and we see this bed. We see the many, many layers being pulled aside, layers of cloth. And of course, you can't help but notice this vast area that's concealed. Sorry, it's doing that to me. Uh, this vast area that's concealed under the bed that remains beyond our sight. Uh, that was, again, a theosophical notion that, you know, whilst we can know a lot through the rational knowledge of the universe and through science, there will always remain a great deal that is unseen and unknowable. It's not just about being unknown, it's unknowable, you know, this spiritual element to, to the understanding. And when you look even further, um, you become very convinced that this is very spooky and uncanny and, and worrying because you look at these fire dogs here which are very spiky and frightening looking, and the shadow they cast, which seems to surround or even entice the girl into that V shape, and the cat as well, who should, well, cats actually come up quite a lot in these pictures as a, as a sinister, untrustworthy, sorry about that, because, you know, we all love them, but the, the cat definitely looks um, disturbing there. And just to add, we have the cabinet again on the right, we have this, this strange cabinet right creepy at the edge, you know, hidden, but with drawers that may open, that may have reveal things. And we have one drawer open with lots of interesting things inside. OK, so that that was um, Kayleigh Robinson's interior. OK, so but he but he paints lots and lots of them. He varies the format and they're terribly interesting um, just on their own. But he did do lots of other type of work too, this artist who's very unsung today and yet was a leading British symbolist. These are works from the Bluebird. This picture, the dream from the Bluebird. So the Bluebird was a symbolist play by the um, European playwright Maurice Metterlink, who created this as a modern fairy tale for adults. This was a time when, under the idea of Edwardian enchantments, um, 1908 this was um this type of fantasy uh creation was very appealing to adults and it, it tapped into the general interest in the spiritual it was known as a spiritual epoch so it wasn't just like a fringe thing there was a general sense of the spiritual at this time partly due to do it to the relative decline the loss of faith after darwin uh, from the 1860s so this has generally been moving um, but also, I think, as a response to the changes of the modern world, they were so unsettling and they were so pervasive. You know, things like noise and um, electricity, they were in your home, they were around you, they weren't just things you could avoid outside. And so 
this affected people at a psychological level and there were new understandings of psychology and dreams and that is a theme of the exhibition too and this picture indeed has the children dropping to sleep but we have a number of images that are uh, familiar in Katie Robinson again a number of tropes a number of motifs the circling birds recur, the ships and journeys. Again, it, they all seem to allude to something unknown and mysterious and profound or to the eternal. You've got a temple there and some sort of spiritual, knowledgeable people. I'll show you some other forms of those in a minute. And this sense of comfort and children and innocence, but obviously slightly disturbing when, you, when you're worried about the more insidious elements around too. And the bluebird does walk that line. It's ostensibly a sort of fairy tale play, but it is quite dark as well. Um, the children search for happiness, but their journey in the middle of the night, guided by a fairy, takes them to some quite frightening places like graveyards. And may I just say again, we have this cabinet on the right again. Again and again, he will include, Katie Robinson will include these elements. And this is what connects him with the later sort of surrealist movement. He was so ahead of his time in that sense. And he will include them again and again, but in interesting and different ways and in ways that literally surprise you. You know, you, you almost don't see it and very much how the later artists, the surrealist artists were operating. Now, this collection here, there's a, there's a small collection of, art, of um, artworks from Leamington Art Gallery that are together in this exhibition in the main room downstairs. And I'll just skim through these because I also want to get on to Evelyn de Morgan. So in these pictures, they're slightly different because Kayleigh Robinson has moved down outside. But interestingly, he has moved outside, but the outside is very much imagined and framed by a very introspective and psychological vision, a very closed and spiritualized vision of the world. Certainly this first picture, The Farewell, firstly terribly modern in the figures. I mean we're looking at figures like Vanessa Bell, the hand that it's quite sinister. The hands and the the um like obelisk type shapes, the monolithic shapes of the figures, the position of the girl and this overarching figure is quite sinister in itself as is the very overly prescient shadow behind and the shadow on the left the large one that seems to uh, appear from this obelisk this block and yet by its size we're not sure now he did that I don't know if you remember in the last picture with the sash he likes to include things that seem to just add that little element of uncertainty settling creepiness of hang on what's that a shadow from and is that something much much bigger looming somewhere that we can't see he was just fascinated by this idea that there's so much we can only see just a flicker of everything there is um the eternal and, and um, just the knowledge of the universe that we, we can't know and that's why here we have an, a light that we have no idea where the light source is coming from and this huge shadow and on the right we just have this blank area of sort of I think starlit sky but the way it's rendered is so flattened is so uh two-dimensional it it doesn't give any depth it, it just blocks us in and it's just straight very unsettling as is the huge area of wall which is the main focus of the picture it just makes the viewer wonder what on earth is behind what it's concealing and what it's what what needs such a big steady wall like this so it's all very intriguing Equally, these two pictures, the bridge, he includes bridges and doorways and uh, windows through doorways, you know, sort of clusters of them to look through, uh, as well as beacons. So sometimes it's about signposting a journey. Sometimes it's about thresholds and portals and journeys. And you see on the left here, this obelisk, this block of stone is back. And um, I mean, this is just fascinating in general. There's time distortions, there's time travel in the sense there's sort of Renaissance figures here, but there's figures that recur in his pictures across different frames. So almost like time travel or like, you know, very, very modern, very contemporary, because that's something we would do now, you know, in our modern media and film, we might have figures that appear in different time zones. But to do this at this time, the early 20th century is, is incredibly modern. And yet, you know, this artist has been overlooked and forgotten. 
really mainly because he was associated with pre-Raphaelitism and in the early 20th century that was just gone you know that was in the sense of they wanted the modern so um yeah we, we really need to look at these pictures again in their day and this painting the night watch such a beautiful work and so intriguing again you have this large area of stone wall you have a tiny little beacon at the top there a little window a few little stars these knights that are falling asleep the night watch uh the knights themselves with their terrible over shiny helmet evoking um later and watts and burn jones but the intriguing thing about this picture is that at the time how surreal and creepy it was was picked up by viewers even then because they they were getting quite used to all his different um visual tri trickery they called them visual tricks and they noticed that he liked having to see these heads in the corner and they didn't quite know i mean it does add it adds layering it gives a strangeness to the perspective by doing that but also they said uh, someone wrote i think it was martin wood wrote this has got anachronisms this has got disturbances of time because surely when these knights were standing there in these traditional uniforms this wasn't a ruin this was a castle this was something they were guarding this this decrepit ruin wouldn't have so it's almost like they're ghosts it's time travel so it's uh, very fascinating and these are the, the sorts of areas that I would want to be unpacking when I work on this further in the future and I book on Kelly Robinson great so very excited to get to the Pickering de Morgans uh, as well so Evelyn de Morgan um, we had two pictures in the exhibition these two we had a much longer list to start it was very hard to choose um she's a very important part of the modern pre-raphaelites having such a notable and distinctive style of her own and in her ambition i would say in her ambitious um compositions and approach her own individual approach and of course she through her interests in spiritualism and her interest in revivalism and modernity she's right at the heart of what we were trying to look at so this picture queen eleanor and the fair rosamond this was included as an example of pre-raphaelite revival and what we, we might expect that to look like so sorry this is a bit of a shot back now back to the idea of pre-raphaelite revivalism we've moved very much into symbolist europe i think kayla robinson have bewitched us a bit there so we're so this is this is medievalism um the the vivid color we've got a dense small cropped image that you know uh encourages the viewer to focus to focus down and look closely in detail very much a pre-raphaelite approach you know to their pictures where they would include lots of symbolism and storytelling and detail that you would read that was something they actually um pushed as a new approach uh, to viewers that that would make you uh, look at pictures in new ways and have to take your time to read them so we have those elements of the sort of traditional pre-raphaelitism this was a pre-raphaelite favorite this story and was created it was dramatized by Swinburne the poet who was friends with Rossetti and it was also painted by several, um, by Burn Jones several times, and by later pre Raphaelites, different artists painted this. And it was a tale of good and evil, Queen Eleanor's evil towards her husband's lover, the fair Rosamond. There's a red thread being dragged across from the lower left, if you can see, um, and uh, by which she's found Rosamond, and also she's carrying a small vial of poison. So, really, quite, quite dark story around the figure on the left we have these sort of evil creatures and presences we have apes uh, the gorillas snakes and um around on the right we've got little cupids and doves so we've got this traditional contrast of good and evil and how they're rendered is really fascinating. I mean, this is the, whilst you can say it's traditional, it's revivalism, yes, but in a terribly modern, interesting 
way because the way it's approached is, is totally you know personal to Eve and Morgan and it reflects her um, interest in the spiritual herself so these shadowy creatures there's a real sense of um, invasion and permeability of space and, and visionary nature how we're engaging with that how they're arriving there in sort of wispy shadowy you know that's very similar to the symbolist element we just saw and they sort of cut across the figure in lines and that adds that that visual approach adds to the sinister to the sense of the attack there's a stained glass window at the back the right uh, probably Lancelot and Guinevere it's another you know hugging the lovers going on and I didn't mention it but at the close in the close of the day right at the start okay Robinson you also had a triptych at the back with a little story in it this is quite a common motif in pre -Raphael like art and the modern pre-Raphaelites, a story within a story, frames within frames, looking through like this. And all the time they're encouraging you to be more and more introspective because the more you look, the more you, you find, the more you see, and you find hidden clues and mysteries. And often there's no answers, but you you cannot help but be seduced to be to be looking. Um, and the way this is framed, I was talking about the sinister, the sort of threat of attack on the left. Well, you also, I mean, the way it's framed, this the woman is arching over and the lady sitting down, that it would be very hard to escape because of the way this is composed. And there's just a little slither of space on the left there. That heavy demarcation that alludes to medieval manuscripts with using vertical horizontal lines denseness density and also um there's all these echoes of the arts and crafts all the time with the stained glass with the heavy wooden furniture from william morris so you're feeling there's a sense of real pre-raphaelite maidens with the red hair and they're being incarcerated in the tower a sense of fairy tales um all of these elements cleverly put together here but What's really notable uh, as well is how Evelyn de Morgan does this in her own way, in her modern, but also just very original way. She has her entirely her own colour scheme. I mean, that really is striking. The robe on the left, and, and this comes up in lots of other paintings, but the robe on the left, you know, we've got tonal colours moving towards something like a rainbow that we see in um, her other works. And a distinctive use of layering, drapery of the figure, which obviously um, she was painting at the Slade, she was painting draped figures. But she's very interested in the textural and the interplay of the texture and the pattern and tonal colours. And that's quite different actually from the pre-Raphaelites with their primary colours. That, that robe is really original and it connects with something like the mermaid's interest, you know, and the um, which features in some of her most important pictures like Daughters of Mist. And, and even this pattern on the arms, there, there's a sense of um, something spiritual going on there, although obviously quite a demonic type of mermaid in that sense. Um, and I must just say, just for gorgeousness, the little dragon in the top left corner is, is really beautiful as well. So, so much again to see and think about in that picture, more every time I look at it. Um, and I think, you know, very ambitious of Evelyn with all the sexism in the uh, art world. You know, the fact that even her name, remember, the, with all the triumphant was, was mistaken. Um, they said it was Burne Jones. So all this sexism and institutional sexism she was facing to be so ambitious to create this story in her own way, in her palette and her approach. And this picture, which I was absolutely delighted to have that, you know, Sarah Hardy helped me to include in this exhibition. It's a study for a picture for a larger painting that wasn't completed, sadly. But I mean, it's a delight to look at on its own terms. Evening star over the sea. What I find really interesting and really enjoy about this picture is, is just that it's a bit strange, a bit different. And it's so simplified and iconic, it draws you to look at it and see more. And that's exactly what it's trying to do. It's 
this picture is essentially concerned with thinking about um, the visual translation of spiritual ideas. So how do you, how can you paint? How can you provide a visual format for other viewers you know, who don't know what you're interested in, what you understand of the spiritual? Um, how can you present that to them and, and have that idea resonate? This was something, thing, having read in the archives when I was researching Kay Lumsden, for example, this is something theosophists were very both hot on, but also really, really into, really interested in, because they found that, much like today, I suppose, that... Um, if you approach something with a sense of come and be a theosophist, you know, come and I'm just like cult, you know, um, people weren't necessarily that receptive. But if you were able to translate some of your ideas and something that captivates you about theosophy, why you're drawn to it in a different way through the arts, particularly, they were they really this this was the synergy that they wanted. Now this picture isn't uh, necessarily theosophist. This um, De Morgan, the, both De Morgans were spiritualists. And spiritualism was a movement that had begun in America and had become a huge movement in the Victorian period uh, with the seances and the contact with the dead, with mediums and table wrapping when you, excuse me, when you um, contacted the dead and they would say hello to you through the table wrapping, quite creepy. So, um, Around this time, moving into the modern century, you have the Society for Psychical Research um, as well, which was a scientific organisation. So this was serious um, investigation into the phenomena of life after death, um, telepathy, communication with the dead, you know, sending letters from, from beyond and things like that. It's all very, it's, it's fascinating. This picture in itself um, is, a, is an intriguing uh, historical document of that period. Um, and in particular, what's interesting about it, again, I just find with Evelyn de Morgan, her originality. I, don't, I, I haven't really seen an image where you've got the floating woman like this in the diaphanous robes and these circles, these sort of, these circles seem very modern to me. They seem from decades later. Um, and they, they're trying to articulate an idea of echoes, spiritual energies. And intriguingly, this is suggested through a pre-Raphaelite type woman with the red hair and classical robes, which again would, would befit some of the later pre-Raphaelite, like a Burton Jones or a um, Watts. Um, so you've got those elements of what you think you know of the knowable with the unknown so as a, as a format and the interest in sleep uh the subconscious of her state as depicted through her um, facial expression i find the pose the arms and her sort of epic pose really fascinating because i find that it resonates with something like michelangelo which katie robinson was very interested in you know she's really again this ambition to really go for it and um think of something using the classics of art but in such a modern way in this sort of esoteric way and just on that note I mean my own work this is something I'm interested in is the sense of spirituality and women as it was considered at the time how we find it manifested because you find it everywhere in the culture of the time um, I mean, this this first to start a Syriaca is a um, Rossetti from the 1860s. So that's an aesthetic work. The middle painting is from 1926 and clearly moving towards surrealism because the sewing machine became an object of the surrealist movement. You have a knowing look of the girl and this painting on the right, which I think may be on display at the Tate. Certainly others of hers are by Annie Swinnerton at the moment. And this is a girl in armour with wings. So these, whilst I, you know, the Evening de Morgan is truly original, it's based on ideas that resonated that were around. Whilst today we might think they look unfamiliar or things, ideas or constructs that seem, um, you know, that they wouldn't be popular, that'd be a bit too far. They're actually very, very ever present in culture. 
so much that they, I'm nearly finished by the way, but so much that they influenced the suffrage movement. They became spiritual imageries for the suffrage movement, um, where woman was womankind was often idolised uh, in a spiritual or emotional sense. Um, she could stand for hope, etc., or justice. Um, this is Joan of Arc. And to finish uh, this picture, so this is a painting by Eleanor Fortescue Brickdale, quite late in the day, 1919, called The Guardian Angel. And what you'll find, and this is in the exhibition, what we'll find terribly striking about this picture is the fact that she is using, like De Morgan, she is using the traditional, the beautiful, pretty angel that we're used to, you know, pre raphaelitis and Burne Jones, we've seen many, many times. Um, and yet the angel form in its sort of epic large form, like I say, traditional, is cradling a modern aeroplane in the middle. And that, that the combination there is, is truly startling and brave. And I think that the fact that you have just throughout the exhibition, the sense of eclectic combinations, intellectual eclectic, you know, um, combining old and new, because modernity was presenting truly new experiences and um, events, you know, like the sinking of the Titanic, like the arrival of aeroplanes in the sky, things that people had to try and find ways to understand. And they sort of framed them through older iconic formats, certainly through the pre-Raphaelites, but through forms of pre-Raphaelite woman too, which the suffragettes were also using to carry them to comfort them through the modern world. And um, I've just included it alongside a couple of pictures just to show how we could compare this picture to something like George Watts here. Uh, the, this is the all pervading, so it's an idea of the woman as powerful spiritual mother aspect, although that's really quite morose and, and, and uh, sinister on the left. In the middle, we have E.R. Hughes, who himself was a late pre Raphaelite, the famous picture, Night with Her Train of Stars, where again the woman as mother, uh, very maternal, beautiful, with children and birds. So you can see uh, Eleanor Fortescue Brickdale drawing on these traditional elements, but being so incredibly brave and innovative to bring in the modern in such a direct way. Um, I don't think I've seen anything quite as original as that in, in that sense to combine modern technology. Although Kayleigh Robinson does it, this is a picture definitely worth seeing. And, you know, not only that, it also highlights the work of a, woman, a female artist that's been neglected. Okay, I think I'll, I think I'll leave it there. Oh, th th these, are, I've just included a couple, there's some articles if you're interested and I've got an email address, but we can, um, Sarah can pass those on. Okay to finish there, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Alice. And um, <laughs> yeah, if you want to send me yeah, the link to the articles that you've recommended people can catch up and then I can certainly include those in um, a sort of a whip round uh, at the end to make sure everybody's got all of the information. Thank you so much, Alice. That was so wonderful to look at these beautiful images and have your deep insights into them, picking oh. up on those minute details just as much as the artist did really and unpacking all of that uh, enormous amount of um, kind of symbolism and the information behind it so I thoroughly enjoyed that and I hope everybody else watching did I'm sure people will have done if anybody does have a question for Alice if you find the chat box function you can type any messages in there and they'll be able to put those to Alice our speaker today Alice are you okay if I turn your video back on as oh well? yes please that's what I was just trying to do yes lovely I think because I was screen sharing It not work yeah I don't know what's going on there we go you should be able to do it now oh great oh yay hi everyone it was strange talking and um, without seeing your faces I must say I do like to see everyone when I'm talking and no you know and, and then you, you build on people's responses but still it was lovely to share I hope you enjoyed it Thank you very much. There's some lovely thank yous coming through. But uh, like I said, do let us know if you have any questions for Alice about any aspect of her talk. Um, I was going to ask Alice, um, 
sort of what was it what was it that you first saw that made you think there's more in this and by more I mean enough to get you going putting two quite different actually exhibitions together and writing the catalogue to accompany that collect the essays to go with it and of course writing the book that you've got coming as well there must have been a kind of yeah. a tipping point where you really decided to go for it um yeah I mean that's it's interesting I, I don't I don't know exactly I couldn't put my finger it but I think it's a, a a couple of stages one was that when I started doing the MA at Royal Holloway in Victorian literature and culture that was when I first sort of became apprised became aware of the pre-Raphaelites and uh, I remember saying to someone oh gosh but they're just like knights and things aren't they and uh, but then the minute I actually looked at them that was it I absolutely loved them and just about because they're not because you think they're going to be knights and maidens but every single one they're always there's something else going on and uh, anyway and then some way that then led me to the later artists through the John Christian catalogue so wonderful the last romantics and I just discovered it at that point and again from that moment I think because there's so much not known about them and I like I like how uh, hard working they are as part of it, like the PRB as well. They're um, they're never they're never okay just to settle on. And I don't know other artists like, but to me it's like they just keep trying to get to something, to get the meaning, you know, to keep reprising, recreating it. And to me that seemed some sort of um, experience of the modern. It just it just I I couldn't stop looking into it, and I'm sure I won't for a long time to come. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've had a question about sending information about the book from Jane. Yes, I'll collaborate with Alice over email after the talk and make sure that I get uh, all the information um, about everything Alice has mentioned, which I, I do appreciate was a lot. And then we'll get that sent round to everybody. So you've got links to, uh, be lovely. to click. There's, there's so much more, um, even just in the exhibition, there, it was so eclectic, it was so hard to choose the works to go in. And, you know, it, it could spawn another five, you know, I hope there are many more exhibitions um, because it's such a rich area, because it was so overlooked for such a long time as well. Um, people haven't looked at these in detail um, and looking both back and forward, it's it's so intriguing. Um, sort of made me think of another question, Alice. Since uh, we've got a quiet audience today, <laughs> uh, is, uh, of course, when we're planning exhibitions and putting these together, there's always reasons why some artworks can't travel. Sometimes they're doubly booked for other exhibitions, or there's conservation issues. If you had your absolute way with this exhibition, was there anything that you really wanted to go in it that you couldn't have? <laughs> Well, I mean, obviously, it's within reason, isn't it? What I mean is, like, obviously, I'd want hundreds of ex hundreds of artworks because the, that's the trouble, I think, with having the luxury of that John Christian catalogue. That was at the Barbican in 89, and he had hundreds of artworks, and he really laid the field out. Now, obviously, these days, people don't tend to do it that big anyway, and you, you, you find an aspect. But I think because it was... Um, we were doing something quite difficult in, in trying to approach them fresh, like revisionists today. Um, we had quite a lot of laying out work to do in this exhibition. So it had different themes and it had to lay out a lot of different things. So I'm not quite answering the question, but all I'm saying is this exhibition, it was a, it was like a learning curve in itself as to how you could even present such an like agglomerate large number of artists and what, how you could speak to people about it, which seems to have come out really lovely. Um, but in any case, I would have liked more to Morgan's, but then it would have actually distorted the others because it would have been too many. But I might have had one of her, like the, the oh, what's the one with the um, age one, Sarah, you know, the one I asked about it at one point. Is it times? Oh, oh, I'll check it. But the one where she's an aging, the aging Jane. Yeah, the aging Jane Morris, that one. But I mean, yeah, the hourglass, that's right. That's exactly. But I also like her ones in the dungeons as well and other things. So I just, I find her work really found. And I, I think I would have liked to have used her as like a godmother almost. Um, in fact, just female artists would be great. 
her as the godmother yeah. and then some other ones you know great yeah because you could do that easily for that period um and I wanted to, I would have liked some works from Russell Coates um I was pretty intrigued by some ones down there as well mm -hmm. but as I say it was a space issue you couldn't you just it was such a big area um so we have had some questions through Alice. So we've had two questions. I can see that the time is ticking away. So I'll try and ask you these two questions quickly. Um, did any of the artists that you study write their own explanations of their work or is everything that you've included in the exhibition sort of yours or later interpretation of their works? That's thank you for that. That's a really good question, actually. Um, and you just can't say everything, you know, when you're giving these talks. So basically, most of the analysis is like a lot of it is essentially from contemporary works um so i based all my research doing the phd uh, on contemporary archival and reviews at the time right so and obviously there's a tension in those reviews because some of them will read the picture and then they'll interpret it through paraphyletism some of them will dismiss the picture because of that and say, oh, it's just a bit, you know, light and it's a bit emotional because the tastes are changing. So whilst you want to use all that original material, you have to be a like, historian and detective about it. You have to think, you know, it's always a sifting of um, later views and what current scholarship says. Then you also have to sift out your own bias in some way, or you have to own it, you know, like I do that. I, I'm going to say my particular approach, which would be feminism and spirituality and such. I have to say that's what it is because it's not the definitive answer. Nothing would be in that sense. So I hope that that helps. But um, yeah, it's all it was all based on a lot of original research. They did describe their works a fair bit, but sometimes like with Katie Robinson, um, there's a few letters describing it, um, leaving a lot of gaps as well, if that makes sense. And you are doing a lot, a lot of detective work through contemporary reviews, but like I say, some of those are so opinionated, some of them just dismiss the works completely, particularly later. They won't say much at all. And then they get less reviews as well because they're just out of favour. So it's, even just that, the, yeah, even just that, that question's interesting because even just the historical material is interesting for these artists in itself and how it's been interpreted. And to some extent, we have to look at it from today's eyes as well because there isn't, because they were very biased. They're incredibly biased at the time because they were totally overtaken with modernism and were writing these ones off completely. It was like, oh yeah, that's another Burne Jones copier, you know, and, it, and it's not enough. It's not, it doesn't look at the works properly yeah and almost to follow on from that uh the second question is um in what way did kelly robinson and his contemporaries identify themselves as symbolist and a note here that the term was quite contested in france and europe since its first usage in the 1880s definitely oh that's a great question too um i'd like to look back at that one in my own research to be honest because it's unlikely that they directly said that um, much at all but there might be some allusions to things like alluding to Burne Jones that itself would have been a coded um, reference to symbolism if you, see, if you see because of the cult of Burne Jones in 1890s Paris and, and then the symbolists. Um, with Kayleigh Robinson he's seen as a pre-Raphaelite follower and he was then he was always connected with the pre-Raphaelites even though when you look at his paintings, it's it's clear, it's so clear that they're symbolist. Uh, well, a bit of both. There's always pre raphaelite strain in there. Um, and yet, as you say in the question, um, that part wouldn't have been declared quite as openly. And yet, you see, with Katie Robinson, his studying in the 1890s, he actually associated with the Nabi group um, of artists like Maurice Denis in France. And um, he, you know, visually is heavily influenced. Now, Marianne Stevens, who has also supported the exhibition, she has written an article on Kayleigh Robinson. It was written in 1977. You can find it in The Connoisseur. And she laid out some of the actual connections with European symbolism, which, as you absolutely rightly identify, they wouldn't necessarily have declared openly. You'd have to hunt for that. And absolutely, when I was researching and writing this, I found a tension between like 
the sort of pre-Raphaelite aspect and what would, you know, the capital D, a decadent aspect. And whenever Kayleigh Robinson veered into more of a Burne Jones type figure, say in the male figure, uh, like um, a, 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 like a, a more thin, a thin, elongated type, pretty male or something, um, there would be a review like, oh no, he's veering into the decadent there. You see, so and and he'd always pull it back, and he'd always ensure that there was pre-Raphaelite type elements, such as ladies with red hair or other familiar parts to it. So it's a very interesting uh, to and fro in those elements, and that seems to echo again that sense of revival, past and present as well. In in that sense, I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's so interesting to think of what um, society mm. at the time defined you as a person based on what sh which art you were painting and your work was being seen as associated with so it seems like there's almost a lot of self-editing going on uh, in the in the artworks as well so that they are or aren't seen in a certain light um, and that for us today it's important to recognize that isn't it so that we can have that thorough historic sort of look back on it without that that bias I think that, that's that's right and I think actually that resonates well with us today I think we generally are, are very aware of that mm. particularly in our social media culture today of that sense of pre pre presenting and representing yourself yeah. you know and how you present yourself in different formats and being aware of formats and platforms I think Hayley Robinson was you know and he knew his audience he, he had like one man shows in per, in small gallery he you know he navigated the art world and he had his sponsors and things and it is a fascinating story and that all of those elements will come out a lot more in in the book when I, you know I'm really delighted to be able to do that and draw those things out more well we can't wait to read it Alice and thank you so much for setting us up um sort of with that fabulous introduction uh, like I said the exhibition is open for another week or so I think the last day is the 28th of February um at the sorry 26 is the Sunday isn't it yeah yeah right, yep. Sunday is last weekend in February anyway, is the last weekend to see the exhibition at the Watts Gallery so make sure you do and we will look forward to your book as well Alice thank you so much to everybody for joining us and um have a good afternoon. Thanks, Alice. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.